Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, I, I, happen, I happen to be a member of the scientific committee, so um, as a part of the general introduction, uh, let me say that we are grateful to Microsoft Research and the Pacific Institute for Mathematical Sciences for financial support. Um, so, um, and uh, well, I guess the only thing that remains for me to do is to introduce the first speaker, Alan Sly, mm. uh, who is a postdoc at Microsoft Research, and as you, see, you will see, who will speak on the Ising model. Please. Oh. Thanks, Chris, and uh, thanks for the, to the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak this morning. So uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, joint work with Ial Lubetsky, my colleague from Microsoft, uh, about the two-dimensional e easing model. Um, so the easing model is uh, a model that comes from uh, statistical physics. It's a model of magnetic systems, kind of the magnetic particles in something like iron. Um, and it's one of the most studied models in statistical physics, and there are literally thousands of papers about it. Um, so you can imagine a, a bunch of particles, uh, each which will all either be plus or minus, um, and they're given, and their positions are given by some uh, graph structure. So the so graph G, uh, and in, for today's talk, you can always think of this as uh, some subset of the d-dimensional lattice. Um, and so uh, it's a probability distribution over configurations, where a configuration is just an assignment of either pluses or minuses to each of the vertices. Um, and these pluses or minuses are called spins. Um, and so the probability distribution uh, weights um, configurations according to how many pluses are next to pluses and minuses are next to minuses, sort of favoring the uh, configurations that have more... Uh, like um, spins in neighboring vertices, um, according to this Hamiltonian uh, type formula. And so when, uh, uh, and the strength of those interactions is governed by uh, the parameter beta, which I'll call the inverse temperature. And uh, so when beta is, say, zero, this is just the uniform distribution and all the spins are independent. Uh, and when beta is large, uh, Sort of, there'll be a tendency for most of the spins to be next to uh, most of the vertices to have uh, the same spins as their neighbors. Okay, so there's been uh, a lot of work on this uh, uh, on the easing model going back well since easing easing started working on it in the 1920s, and for the two-dimensional model, um, sort of. Um, since uh, the work of Onsanger in the early 1940s, um, it's been known, well, uh, established um, sort of the exact location of uh, a fa the phase transition of the model. So when beta is small in the high temperature phase, sort of all the spins, the pluses and minuses, are um, sort of the correlations between them decay very quickly, sort of exponentially in the distance. Um, and so there's no structure. It kind of looks like uh, random noise. Whereas uh, at low temperatures, uh, you have a lot of structure, um, mainly either, um, and you mainly have pluses next to pluses and minuses next to minuses. And, um, and the reason why you have plus on the top and minus on the bottom is because of the, the boundary conditions imposed here. And then, uh, and then the the point at which you have a transition between these two uh, regimes is uh, at the critical temperature, which is um, at a, a beta, which is exactly known. Okay, and uh, some of the most interesting mathematics happens at exactly at the critical temperature, and I'll talk more about that la um, later in the talk. Uh, so, so this talk will be about uh, sort of the Glauber dynamics, which you can think of as a dynamical version for the easing model. So it's a Markov chain used for sampling from the distribution. Um, and, uh, and so you, 
which you can think of as kind of the spins randomly evolving over time. So each vertex gets a rate one uh, Poisson clock. Um, and when uh, the clock rings for that vertex, you look at the neighboring vertices um, and work out the conditional distribution at that vertex given the neighbors. And this will just be a function of how many pluses and how many minuses occur amongst the neighbors and the, the interaction strength beta. And so then you just resample the vertex according to that distribution. Um, and so this is uh, just one up update of the dynamics. Um, and the, the distribution is uh, stationary and ergodic uh, and reversible, um, or the, the Markov chain is ergodic and reversible with respect to uh, the stationary distribution. So eventually, um, if you run it a lot, enough time, uh, it will uh, converge to the stationary measure mu. And so the main question for this talk is, when you have a large system, so the number of vertices is large, uh, how, does, uh, how long does it take for this uh, Markov chain to reach uh, sort of statistical equilibrium? So what's the mixing time for it? Uh, so there are a couple of different ways you can uh, measure the, the rate of convergence of the Markov chain. Uh, one will be uh, the spectral gap, and this will be the main one I'm uh, going to be talking about for this uh, talk. Um, but you can um, also talk a bit about uh, the mixing time uh, the, in terms of total variation distance. So this is essentially how long it takes for the Markov chain um, to be close to its uh, stationary distribution from a worst case starting point, say within epsilon in the total variation distance. And the total variation distance is just like the L1 distance between the measures. Okay, and, and so the question is, for different values of beta, uh, the inverse temperature, uh, how do these uh, parameters vary as the size of the system grows? Okay, so there's been a lot, like, a lot of work on this uh, topic, and there's kind of a general picture for different uh, values of uh, beta. So when, uh, <coughs> when beta is large, uh, there's, uh, the, the strengths of the interactions are strong. There's a bottleneck in the, uh, for the Markov chain, and it takes exponentially long to mix. So if we, uh, if we fix sort of our, our graph being a, a box in the d-dimensional lattice of side length n, uh, then the uh, with, say, either periodic or free boundary conditions, um, then the mixing time will tend to grow like exponentially in n to the d minus 1. Uh, on the other hand, it's expected that at the critical temperature, it should be uh, just polynomial in the size of the system. Um, and then at high temperatures, the, the spectral gap uh, should be of constant order, so not, um, not growing with this, well, not growing beyond a certain point with the size of the system. And the mixing time should be of uh, order log n. Uh, and it should also um, uh, ha have uh, the so-called uh, cutoff phenomena, which essentially says that um, if you look at the distance of the Markov chain from stationarity, it, um, in the total variation distance, say, it goes from close to 1 to close to 0 over a, a very short time period. Uh, so this is kind of, so some of this picture is known um, for some models like the easing model uh, or parts of it on different graphs. And so I'm going to be talking in particular about uh, the two-dimensional lattice. So I'll tell you, so this is what's kind of expected by physicists and in, is sort of in line with which what rigorous results have been proved so far. Um, okay, and for the um, for the easing model, a lot um, yeah a lot is known, and so in the uh, particularly by work in the late 80s and early 90s um, by Debuchin and Sloshman, um, Eisenman, Struk, Zegolinsky, and culminating in work by uh, 
Martinelli and his co-authors, um, both the, the high and the low temperature regimes are quite well understood. So in particular at high temperatures, when beta is small and the interactions are weak, uh, the, the spectral gap is known to be uniformly bounded in the size of the system. Um, and the mixing time is known to be a, uh, order log n. For any beta less than the critical value beta c uh, when you're in two dimensions. In higher dimensions, uh, this is only known for sufficiently small beta. Um, and uh, Yuval asked uh, the question, uh, does, uh, do the dynamics obey the cutoff phenomena? And uh, recently with uh, Eyal, we uh, established this and showed that the uh, mixing time occurs at uh, the inverse spectral gap times uh, log n up to little order factors. Okay, and at low temperatures, um, sort of work of uh, Martinelli and others uh, confirmed uh, sort of exact, pretty much everything you could ask about uh, the mixing time and the inverse spectral gap. That the exponential uh, in n, um, and even the constant in the exponential is uh, known explicitly. So, um, so the remaining question uh, then is what happens at the critical temperature beta c? And uh, does this obey the uh, sort of polynomial growth that uh, was predicted? Okay. So, uh, first of all, um, it's known, uh, it's been, well, yeah. It's known that the, it grows at least as fast as a polynomial. And this uh, comes from uh, sort of results on correlation decay, which go back to Onsaga in the 40s. Uh, and you can also uh, work of Holly in the 90s. So, it's at least polynomial. And, uh, uh, numerical uh, estimates by physicists uh, seem to confirm the um, polynomial picture and show that the, the inverse spectral gap seems to grow at, a, at something like n to the 2.17. So, uh, uh, and this, is, uh, this seems to be universal in the sense that it doesn't depend on uh, the square lattice. It also seems to be the same exponent for, say, the hexa two-dimensional hexagonal lattices or triangular lattices as well. Um, and yeah, but, but this 2.17, this isn't uh, a prediction from some sort of non-rigorous uh, or uh, techniques or heuristics. This is just what comes up in the numerics. And there's no actual uh, conjecture about what the uh, critical dynamical exponent should be for this. Um, and in terms of rigorous work, um, sort of before the work that I'll uh, uh, tell you about in a couple of slides, uh, there's, there were no sub-exponential bounds for the, for the mixing time. Um, so, uh, so it was an open question as to whether or not it was actually polynomial, and it could be anything up to exponential. Um, this was, uh, the question has been answered on uh, uh, the complete graph and the regular tree, and even in these cases it was uh, like a very challenging result. Okay. So, so the first time I gave this talk, uh, someone asked the question, uh, it's like, you know what happens in high temperatures and low temperatures? That's like leaves only one particular value of beta. Why do you uh, why do you care so much about this? Uh, and uh, and it's not just a matter of uh, like completeness and uh, trying to get it for every value. Some of the most interesting mathematics occurs uh, uh, when beta equals beta c. Um, and in particular, um, it's uh, part of the sort of uh, revolution uh, of the last decade uh, that's sort of been sparked by the advent of uh, uh, SLE. And so, so recently, um, in the last few years, 
Smirnov uh, described the full scaling limit of the critical easing model in terms of if you look at the boundaries between the plus clusters and the minus clusters, um, uh, saying that these converge to uh, the conformal loop ensemble, which is like a, a collection of SLE type curves. And uh, for this and other work, um, he re uh, recently won the Fields Medal. Um, and, and this convergence to SLE, we don't use directly in our proof, um, but it motivated some of the ideas of it. And in, but we do use uh, Rousseau Seymour Welsh type estimates, which I'll uh, explain later on, which were part of uh, this program of um, convergence to uh, uh, SLE. Okay. Okay, so uh, the main result uh, is that, yes, indeed, uh, sort of, yeah, this inverse spectral gap is bounded by some uh, polynomial in N. Um, and this holds for arbitrary boundary conditions. Um, and the, yeah. Uh, and saying arbitrary uh, boundary conditions here is not just uh, sort of, trying to be as general as possible, it's really important for the proof that we uh, prove it not just for one particular boundary condition, but for all of them. Um, because it's, uh, in a, the proof is in a sense inductive. Um, yeah, so, so, yeah, the inverse spectral gap grows uh, as a polynomial. And um, fairly standard estimates um, show that this also uh, extends to uh, the mixing time in total variation distance, and that's also polynomial. Uh, but we don't actually have, um, we don't actually know what the constant C here is, just that there is some fixed constant. Okay. Um, this also gives uh, a polynomial upper bound for the um, sort of coupling from the past uh, uh, sort of approach to sampling uh, to perfect simulation for the easing model at the um, critical temperature. And this was uh, one of the examples in uh, uh, David's uh, with Jim Prop's original paper on uh, coupling from the past and perfect simulation. So we can say that the expected running time is actually polynomial. Um, and we can, we also give a, uh, an improved lower bound on the mixing time of uh, n to the 7 over 4. And so uh, this doesn't match the sort of predict or the numerical experiments, uh, but 7 over 4 is maybe not so far from 2.17. Uh, but we don't, uh, yeah, we don't know how to sort of improve this even heuristically. Uh, okay, so, so the main techniques uh, are a sort of multi-scale approach. And so you can say, what does it, um, what does it mean uh, to have a polynomial, have the inverse gap growing at a polynomial rate? Well, it means, say you uh, double the size of the box, it means that the inverse gap should increase by at most uh, a constant multiplicative factor. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, you have to remember where breakfast and the food is. Uh, and if you want to know the wireless code, you should probably write this down. Uh, so, So we know, let's say we know that if you look at the bottom two thirds, um, this mixes well, and the top two thirds, that uh, this also mixes well, um, how can we uh, take this to sort of a, a result in terms of the mixing time of this uh, whole box? And that will be the, the main uh, the 
uh, sort of idea of the proof. And this is, uh, this is essentially what people do in high temperatures. And, uh, and the point is there to take advantage of the um, fact that at high temperatures, you have uh, sort of strong decay of correlations. So um, the effect of vertices here is going on a, a vertex here is very weak if, uh, if the distance is large. Uh, and you can essentially, uh, because it decays exponentially, you can, in a sense, just add up the effect for each particular vertex. Um, but this approach uh, just doesn't work at the critical temperature, because rather than having exponential decay of correlations, you have uh, correlations decaying at some slow polynomial rate. Um, and so, in a sense, our proof is about saying what, not what is the effect of conditioning a single vertex, but what's the effect of conditioning uh, the entire face of a box and uh, um, proving some weak spatial mixing results about this. Um, and that will make the proof go through. So, uh, I guess this slide, I'm going to just... Uh, explain it uh, uh, in pictures. So suppose we have a box of, say, roughly equal side length and two boundary conditions, psi and eta. And they agree on three of the sides, but psi is not equal to eta on the bottom boundary. What can we say about the two measures inside this box? Well, it could be that one is all plus on the bottom and the other is all minus. So towards the bottom of the box, the measures will be very different, potentially. Um, so you can't hope to say that they're similar everywhere inside the box. Um, but what if I just want to say that if this, is, if this is distance r here, above some level rho times r, what if I'm only interested in the measure above here? And so just to make it even simpler, just the measure in the top half of the box. Um, how much does uh, changing the boundary condition on the bottom affect the measure here? Uh, and our result is that uh, if you look at the projection of the easing model on the top half of the box for the two different boundary conditions, then the total variation distance is uh, uh, sort of less than or equal to um, uh, some function of rho here. Uh, and it's, in particular, strictly less than 1. So another way of formulating this is you can say, suppose we take these two measures we can couple them so that on the top half of the box, they agree with some probability bounded uh, away from zero. Um, and, uh, and so this, this statement is just uh, something purely about the static easing model. There's no Glauber dynamics at all in here. But uh, now, given this statement, I'll, uh, I'll tell you how we um, uh, do the inductive step to show, uh, <coughs> to compare the, uh, the spectral gaps on different scales. <coughs> uh, and this is done using uh, the block dynamics, which is uh, sort of the standard kind of multi-scale approach to uh, understanding spectral gaps for the easing model and under other spin systems. Um, and so the idea is you so let's say lambda is uh, the rectangle that we want to know the spectral gap for, uh, for or to bound it on. And so break lambda up into uh, some possibly overlapping uh, sets, uh, bi. Then you can bound the, the inverse spectral gap of, on lambda by the inverse spectral gaps of the, on the bi, on, on the sub-blocks. Um, but also taking a maximum over 
all boundary conditions uh, on these uh, on the blocks. And this is uh, this is why we need our proof to work for all boundary conditions uh, so that this induction will work. Okay, and then there are correction terms as well. The first one is just the uh, how many times vertices appear in uh, uh, different blocks. And in our construction, you can just take this as being a two because uh, there'll only be two blocks. Um, and the other one is the inverse spectral gap of what's called the block dynamics. And this is a, this is a generalization of the uh, Glauber dynamics, where rather than taking a vertex and updating it according to its stationary distribution, uh, you, take, you take a whole uh, block, delete all the spins in here, and update it according to its conditional distribution given the configuration on the uh, complement of the block. Um, and this is again uh, reversible with respect to the stationary distribution. Um, and it will be simpler to analyze. So uh, in particular, we'll take just about the simplest decomposition into blocks uh, that you could ask for. So. Oh, that's not very good. And this is what happens uh, in when the temperature is critical. Yes, so, th so this, uh, this is all about, uh, I mean, this result holds for any temperature, but the, the analysis I'll tell you now will be relying on the fact that it's at the critical temperature. Uh, because it will rely on uh, this spatial mixing result, which is for the critical temperature, which is, so I guess I should have said this is false if uh, uh, you're at low temperatures. Um, and so in particular, that's why you won't get uh, polynomial mixing at low temperatures. Okay, so we have our box and split it up into two blocks. Uh, the bottom two-thirds of the block and the top two-thirds. And our dynamics will go pick one of these blocks, delete all the spins in it, and update the rest according to the conditional distribution uh, given the rest of the block. So, and what I want to do is show that this has a, a uniformly bounded uh, inverse spectral gap. Um, and I can do that by showing that it has a uniformly bounded uh, mixing time uh, for any external boundary condition. Um, and I'll do that by showing that given any starting configuration, uh, the probability of uh, coupling within two steps is uniformly bounded away from zero. So. Uh, so let's say your first step is you update the top block. And so uh, now when doing updating that, you delete all the spins in the top two thirds and then look at the boundary condition you have. Three of them are given from the, by the external boundary condition uh, in the problem. But the bottom one comes from uh, the spins in uh, the complement of the block. And so these could be different in the two copies of the chain. But the spatial mixing result says that with some probability that's uniformly bounded away from zero, we can couple them in uh, the top half of the block. Uh, yeah, yeah, the top half of the block and so the top third of the, uh, of the whole uh, thing. And now say we update the bottom block then uh, uh, if we've coupled the top half, then they have the, the same boundary condition in both copies of the chain um, here uh, uh, from coming from the top boundary. And the other two, three boundaries are just the same because they're fixed external boundary conditions. So given that we coupled the top half, the top third, then we can, in the next step, couple the rest as well. So, 
So this gives a, a positive probability of uh, coupling it in just two steps. And, this, uh, and so in particular, the mixing time is um, uniformly bounded, and the inverse spectral gap is also uniformly bounded. OK, so, uh, so then, well, if you plug this into this form, into the formula, so we can take the block dynamics to be, uh, uh, have an inverse gap which is uniformly bounded. This n will just be 2. So the inverse spectral gap on the larger block is bounded by a constant times the inverse spectral gap on these uh, sub-blocks. So we can now just do induction. And uh, each, so each time the volume decreases by 2 thirds, uh, and there's a multiplicative factor of uh, um, some constant in the inverse spectral gaps. So you do this sort of order log n number of times, uh, and you get some constant to the power of, I guess, 2 log base 3 on 2n, which will just be n to some constant. Uh, so this, uh, this gives the polynomial upper bound on the inverse spectral gap. So, so the key thing is uh, proving the right spatial mixing result. And, uh, uh, and, and that we can indeed uh, say that when we have two boundary conditions, we can couple the top half of the block with uh, the posi uh, probability bounded away from zero. So it would be easier to say, say how to do this first, rather than for general boundary conditions, I want to say how you do this for uh, two specific boundary conditions. Because in some sense, it, uh, this was the motivating idea. So suppose on the one hand, we just have the all plus boundary. Uh, and on the other hand, we have plus on three sides, but minus on the bottom. OK. This is, yeah, uh, so the, the spins giving the boundary condition uh, will be yeah, plus here and minus here. OK, so now you can ask, well, I want to try and couple these distribution so that they agree in the top half. Let's, uh, let's reveal the kind of cluster of minuses on the bottom, which will be some, uh, which will give some random curve uh, with minus, minuses on one side and pluses on the other. OK. And above, above this curve, you now have uh, ba uh, plus boundary conditions on all of, this, uh, um, all of this space. And so by monotonicity, I can uh, uh, couple these two uh, so that above this random curve, um, OK, I can put pluses along here as well. And above this random curve, I can couple them so that they're equal. Because they just have, both have all plus uh, conditions everywhere. Um, so the question then is, in terms of whether or not the top half is the same, is does this random curve exceed the sort of half, uh, the halfway point? And, uh, and the point now is that uh, Smirnov's uh, kind of results and theory say that this curve should converge to some uh, SLE uh, type curve, well, to an SLE curve. And uh, in particular, well, I'm not going to tell you all the properties of that, but uh, one thing will be that uh, with positive probability, it will stay in the bottom half of the curve. Uh, in the bottom half. So in the scaling limit, the probability of this curve staying in the bottom half 
uh, will be strictly bounded away from one. Um, and uh, probability of it staying in the, the chance of it, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. So the chance that it crosses the curve will be less than one. Uh, okay, so, so, we can, so for these two particular boundary conditions, we can couple the, the top half with uh, some probability uh, strictly uh, greater than zero, independent of uh, the size of the system. But our inductive proof really needs uh, the result to hold for every boundary condition. And there isn't uh, sort of the theory of the, well, we're also using the monotonicity of these uh, particular boundary conditions, but also there isn't really a, uh, a theory of what the <coughs> scaling limits should look like for completely arbitrary boundary conditions. Um, and so instead to deal with this, we uh, pass to uh, the FK easing model. So there's, uh, uh, okay, so in the, the, F, yeah, the FK model or the random cluster model is uh, like a, just briefly like a, a kind of like a dependent uh, model of percolation. So, um, so you do independent percolation, but then reweight the probability according to the number of clusters you see. And in the easing model case, it's just according to two to the power of the number of clusters. Uh, and then the edwards sokal coupling gives a way of relating uh, the easing model to the FK model. Uh, but again, the, this uh, arbitrary boundary condition uh, that we have is problematic because it conditioning on a particular boundary condition in the easing model is like uh, conditioning on certain wirings on the boundary, but also on the event that there's no crossing on the FK model for, from a, a plus vertex to a minus vertex. And, uh, and this could happen with, uh, and the chance of this event could be exponentially small for particular boundary conditions. Okay, um, like in particular if your boundary conditions were plus, minus, plus, minus all around. Um, but but this, is, uh, this is a decreasing event, so we can use uh, monotonicity in the FKG inequality. And you can translate the problem into asking, if you look at the corresponding FK model, um, does the cluster connected to the bottom exceed, say, the halfway point? And, uh, and this is, uh, and for this we can use the new Russo Seymour Welsh estimates uh, developed by uh, Dumnil, Copan, Hongler, and Nolan, um, and uh, which show that this, is, this probability is uh, strictly, uh, uh, or the probability of it exceeding uh, this line is strictly bounded away from one. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, and so. What we can do is, um, outside of this component that's uh, connected to the bottom boundary, we can couple everything else and then transfer it to the easing model and uh, uh, by the edward sokar coupling and couple everything there as well. Okay, so um, a couple of sort of open questions would be, uh, and these are probably not so easy. Um, can you calculate the precise uh, sort of universal critical dynamical exponent? Uh, we don't even really have a, a guess for what the correct answer there should be. And also, what can you say in uh, higher dimensions, like, um, and in particular in uh, dimension three? Okay, uh, thank you. Describe again how you 
how you coupled these paths on the bottom there? Um, OK, yeah. So, so first of all, you reveal, you sort of reveal the sort of minus component. And just by looking at one vertex at a time, is this minus or plus? And yeah. do that until you can't go <coughs> any further. Right. And then sort of by monotonicity argument, you can say that, well, along this curve, because this is even more plus, it should be at least as, uh, at least. At least as plus, which is all plus. Um, and, then, and then in what's remaining, you have uh, um, all plus boundary conditions on both. Okay. And so then it's just, uh, okay. yeah. Right, so, so that curve there could have some plus boundary conditions as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So you sort of already assume that you have the monotone couple. Yeah. Right. Please. You mentioned that the numerical experimentation suggested that there should be some kind of universal exponent around 2.17. Yeah. Do you have intuition for why that shouldn't depend on the type of graph? Um, I don't have intuition. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so, no. <laughs> um, and and I think physicists probably do, and I not not really sure. I yeah, no, but for for a two dimensional system, if you compare the square lattice and the hexagonal lattice, well, why should they be the same? I have a quick question um, concerning um, the method of um, simulating the process. Basically, you know, you're asking a question about convergence to uh, the stationary distribution. Yeah. If I understand correctly, uh, the whole procedure would be done at a critical temperature, right? I mean, the, yeah. the, the simulation. Um, but the, the estimate also um, for the mixing time assumes that you can start from any initial configuration, right? Yeah. Uh, so, 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 so my point is this. Would it make sense to start your simulations at a high temperature where you have exponential convergence to something? Mm -hmm. So you get immediately from some un, um, extreme or unusual yeah. initial configuration to, to something that looks maybe more standard yeah. or, or normal, and then switch the temperature. Uh, so this is so this is um, I think goes by the name of uh, simulated annealing and uh, varying the temperature as you go and uh, in some models this uh, does improve the the mixing time um, and I think definitely you can show that say in the you looked at the complete graph for the easing model, you could, you could prove that this uh, sort of gives you a faster way of bounding the mixing time at low temperatures. Um, because uh, there, there's a bottleneck between mainly plus configurations and mainly minus configurations. And if you do it at high temperatures, then it kind of lets the Markov chain choose which one um, to take. On the other hand, there are there are other models, uh, like the POTS models, for which it's been proved that this kind of technique doesn't, uh, doesn't work. So it, it depends on the model and the graph. Um, um, are you on your, your results just for the square lattice, or can you handle any lattice? Um, OK. Do the. Uh, so OK, do the Rousseau Seymour Welsh estimates apply in those ones as well? Uh, so if, as long as we know these uh, Rousseau Seymour Welsh type estimates, then everything else goes through. And uh, so it depends on that, and I'm not exactly sure. If, if they don't, then not really, we're going to see more work. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have to get back to them there. Okay, I mean, the yeah. follow-up yeah. question is, so your results don't use the fact that, you, I mean, in this case, you know explicitly what the data C is, but you don't need to use that fact, is that right? Yeah, yeah, we, it's, and uh, the result depends on uh, crossing probabilities in the... I, I think they should, because, uh, I mean, there's only three holes everywhere, like, surprisingly, for, for FK easing and for easing, they know mm. for any lattice, all these conformal uh, theory and, and for population, mm. they don't, but yeah, right. I think it works. Yeah, yeah. So for some, for some of the results, the SLA results, it does hold in general. I'm not, not exactly sure whether or not they like, wrote it down for outfit, the ones we need in particular. Yeah. But, but really, the important thing is uh, crossing probabilities. And, yeah. so, so, I mean, your proof is certainly robust to the lattice. Yes. yes. OK, let's thank the speaker again. So our next speaker is Ed Weimar, who needs no introduction to people who've been to the seminar um, frequently. And um, anyway, here he is. Thanks, Martin. So uh, thank you, Martin. And thank you. Uh, I have to also thank our local organizers from Oregon who drew my hat out this time to be a speaker from, from Oregon. And, um, also, uh, um, not only maybe I don't need an introduction for people who've been here before, but this is also a topic. The last time I spoke here, I think it was the same kind of topic. And this, there'll be different material, new results, but, but similar topic. And um, it's joint work with uh, colleagues at, uh, uh, this is a graduate student, Tilanka Apolohamalaj, who's here today, and Vishali Bokil, Enrique Toman, and, Brian Wood, we're all in math except for Brian, who's in uh, environmental engineering and so forth. And um, <clears throat> this is uh, work that uh, was supported by a, uh, one of these uh, geoscience, math geoscience grants from NSF. I should mention that too, I suppose. And I'm going to start by just sort of describing um, Three different examples. Uh, this first example, this is this right here, is Brian's lab, and um, it's a little bit. This right, this is the actual apparatus. What it is is it's a um, a column that has uh, two two glass beads packed in it. One is this the coarse grain glass beads, and the other is very fine glass. And um, so on one half, the top half say is is the coarse grain, and the bottom half is the uh, fine grain sand, and it's saturated with water. And then, uh, you know, I always envisioned these things until I saw his lab. I always thought they would be horizontal, but his is vertical. But basically, you put dye in um, on one end, and then you, uh, the dye runs through, and, and, and you measure how long it takes to get up, come out the other end. And so basically, what you have in, in a, in, as, a, as a model for, of this sort is a, um, a fixed law, a flux law, basically it's a standard like Fourier law or flux law, uh, but the diffusion coefficient is different in the coarse and fine grain. So you have, and you have an interface there where there's an abrupt change in the, in the uh, diffusion coefficient. And then usually there's, a, there's also a, a flow through the, a constant rate through the, through the system. This is, uh, these are results of an experiment that were performed at the Lawrence Livermore Berkeley lab of a very similar nature uh, in 2009. And in fact, the, what I just showed you uh, was Brian's uh, confirmation of these results in, in the lab at OSU. So uh, what, they, what they are, are basically, they're called breakthrough curves. And um, they measure how long it takes to, um, to go from uh, one end to the other, but they do it in two different frameworks. One is that you put the, you inject on the coarse grain in, and you, 
you, you retrieve it on the fine grained end, or you can inject on the fine grained end and retrieve it at the coarse grained end. A completely symmetrical situation. However, what these curves are showing, and now we, the, the probability problem that you get out of this is that if you have a, a diffusion coefficient d minus here and a diffusion coefficient d plus here, and the interface is here, and you inject at minus one, and then you see how long does it take to come through out here versus if you inject here and see how long it takes to come through here with the velocities completely reversed. Uh, which is more likely to be removed first? That becomes sort of the question. And what the experiments are showing is uh, an asymmetry in that breakthrough curve. So I'll come back to that. But that's, that's sort of a motivating question uh, involving a problem with an interface. The second example is, looks quite different. And it looks like a, a geophysics or oceanography type problem. However, it's actually, it is that, but it is really the, the point of emphasis is more from ecology. And the reason that it's an ecology problem is that if you look at this uh, string of lights here, this is off the uh, coast of Argentina, this string of lights here is a string of fishing vessels that are, have been there routinely forever, I, I, as I understand. And what's going on is that, that this, there's a break in the shoreline that where, the, where the, the slope up here is fairly flat and shallow, and then there's a, there's a steep break. And at that break is exactly where those fishing boats are lined up because there's an upwelling that's occurring there, and it's bringing all this nutrient-rich rich water from cold water from below and bringing it up. So it's sort of a, a, a food service mechanism for, for these fish. and, um, and uh, it's a very, very important. Upwelling occurs, I'm told, in like 1% of the ocean. It's a, it's a, it, and however, upwelling is responsible for like over 50% of, of fisheries. That's the kind of thing that, that you can read about these, these things. So and it, it does, upwelling events do have a big impact on fishing and fish food as a, I mean, as a, as a resource. And um, what, what's characteristic of this, or somewhat unique about this particular one, is that it's due to this um, uh, break in the, in the slope. And normally, these, these, cup, these upwellings are caused by uh, winds. This is a, a model. This is just to show. I don't want to go through any of the details. A, a derivation of a model which describes the free surface where you have a, a break in the slope uh, down here. Uh, that, that, that represents sort of the, the coastline of, uh, of Argentina. And when you derive for the free surface, when you derive using just geostrophic balance physics equations, you get an equation which looks like this. And um, this term here, because it's in the southern hemisphere, is negative. So if you put that over on the other side, you'll have a minus times that. And this, this is going to be, again, a constant, roughly. It's going to be a constant here and a constant there to, to indicate a sharp break. And so again, you have a diffusion equation for the free surface with a, uh, with a um, uh, uh, well, that should be a minus, sorry. Uh, yeah, that's, that, you have a diff two different diffusion coefficients at an interface, the interface being caused by that break. So that's my example number two of, again, a diffusion equation of where there's an interface. And the third example is an example that it's literally from my backyard in some sense. I, I'll tell you why. The Fender's blue butterfly is a butterfly that's on the endangered species list. And, um, and in fact, it, it's in the Willamette Valley of Oregon where, where, there's, uh, where, they're, where, where they live. And uh, what they do is they, they live in these, what they like are these, patch, these patches of lupin. Here's what one lupin looks like. But they like these big patches of lupin. And the ecologists, because they're on endangered species, there's a lot of literature, statistical literature about them. And I just quoted here one just to give a sample of the kind of questions. Uh, this is from an ecology journal. Uh, given past research on Fender's Blue and the potential to investigate response to patch boundaries in this system, we asked two central questions. First, how do organisms respond to habitat edges, and what are the implications of this behavior for their residence times? 
So I indicate this just as another example. What, what's going on is there's a distribution of these lupin patches throughout the region, and when butterflies are in these lupin patches, they're very happy and they tend to kind of just wander around and, and not move too quickly. But when they get outside of their patch, you know, they kind of worried and they, they kind of fly around all over the place. So they have a different kind of dispersivity rate when they're outside a patch as w versus when they're in a patch. So these are sort of just three examples to show uh, the, the, the uh, somewhat um, natural consideration of, of interface problems. What's different about the three examples, however, is what, ha what, the, what, the, what happens at the, at the interface. In the first example, because of just conservation of mass, the, the natural interface condition uh, is continuity of flux across the interface. Because this is consistent with, with what's observed. It's consistent with this Fickian sort of model of diffusion and so forth. However, for the, for the uh, free surface and the oceanography example, the con it's the continuity of the, of the, uh, of the uh, derivative that, that is imposed by the physical considerations. In the case of the butterflies and so forth, this is sort of a new example to us that kind of getting interested in, but I'm not quite sure how to, to, to address what the interface condition actually is and that'll require looking at more data and so forth. But in general, these, the, the interface conditions are in conditions on the, uh, at the interface of, of this form. And um, you know, you can, by dividing this by d plus plus d minus, you can think of a lambda there. So it's a, and here it's lambda is equal to a half. So you have different conditions of that form. <clears throat> So this is a probability, so let's, let's kind of at least go back to a little bit of probability. And if you, if you think about, although one can argue whether Feller's classification of diffusions uh, is it, it, certainly motivated by probability, but, but um, it's more or less an analytic resolution of that question. But I'm just kind of reminding you here that Feller, according to Feller's theory, you know, given these coefficients, just measurable coefficients, um, there's a, uh, there's a, uh, diffusion corresponding to that because it'll determine a speed measure and a, and a uh, scale function. And so you can ask yourself or you can try to work out what would be the interface condition in the case of Feller's diffusion that you would get from this. We can talk about that later. Similarly, one could go to stroop veridon and you can pose a martingale problem. So stroop veridon given those coefficients and give, would, for the given generator would say, you know, you, uh, you look for a, a, a martingale uh, for all f and c infinity for those gi given coefficients. And if you apply that, then what happens as a consequence of the stroop veridon formulation, you get, a, uh, you get a solution, but because of the, the test functions are all c in the, for the domain are all c infinity functions, you get a, an interface condition which is uh, um, the continuity of the derivatives. So then you can ask, you know, well, what do you do about other interfaces from, the point of, from this point of view? And one approach to answering that question is just to say, well, you know, you can, by transforming space, you can make, if you, if you have a given interface condition, so I denote that by if belonging to I lambda, that's just notation to mean that you have this interface condition. Well, then you can transform space so that the composition is, is with one half, so it's continuous derivatives, and then you can adjust time and one, then solve for the, the process as a stroop veridon problem using this, and then sort of go backwards and get a solution that, um, for the given problem. But again, this is still kind of analytic machinery. It's kind of an analytic approach to this problem. I mentioned here Alknine, who also has uh, uh, worked in this, in this area, and, and, and he, by his uh, approach has been, uh, one of them was to look at, I wrote that operator in divergence form, and, you can, and then you look at it as a diffusion with generalized coefficients, and I believe that he has a very similar uh, resolution of, of this, what I call, this remedy to, to the Martingale problem anyway, so I just mentioned it here. But I'm going to put up here, this is sort of my, the students from OSU know this is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, 
And uh, it's a quote from uh, that, you know, I, I don't know that how many probabilists see this, but it's uh, uh, from Jean Baptiste Perrin's little notebook called Adams, which is just a wonderful little thin book, which is the notebook that he wrote while he was doing experiments to uh, determine Avogadro's constant after Einstein had shown that that uh, diffusion, uh, the diffusion coefficient could be viewed either statistically or physically. And, uh, and, and so th they set about to do all these experiments. And I just want to just, I, I, for me, I, I think, I, I, you know, he got a Nobel Prize for, for determining Avogadro's constant. Well, that's an important thing, you know, so it's worthwhile. But this, to me, is really shows his genius. And he says at the time, Trajectories are confused and complicated so often rapidly that it's impossible to follow them. The trajectory actually measured is very much simpler and shorter than the real one. Similarly, the apparent mean speed of grain during a given time varies in the wildest way in magnitude and direction and does not tend to a limit at the time taken for an observation decreases, as may be easily shown by noting. This is really primitive camera technology that they had, but they, it's amazing that they did do these kinds of photography and they went from 20 a second, um, or every five seconds, and, and, or minutes to five seconds, to 20th of a second. And uh, it is impossible to fix a tangent, even approximately, at any point on a trajectory. And we are thus reminded of the continuous underived functions of the mathematician. So, you know, I was always kind of, you know, math we always get scooped by physicists but in terms of <laughs> what people really know. And so I, I, I was just really amazed by this. this uh, uh, quote. So, but I, I, I really put it here because now I, I want to get away from really the analysis problem and ask more the question of, you know, what would Perrin see if he were looking, for example, at this salute under a microscope? And the a first step toward the probabilistic solution to that is given by the notion of skew Brownian motion, which I did talk about here once before, and uh, probably is familiar to most everybody here. But basically, uh, you have an interface condition on the functions in the domain of the, of the Laplacian. And they ask the question, well, how do you construct a stochastic process which would um, have this as its Markov process with this as its generator on this particular domain? And the answer is that you uh, take a reflecting Brownian motion. You start with that. And then you, and you enumerate the excursions. And, um, and then you go through and you toss coins, and, and if you get a, a tail, you flip it down, otherwise you keep it up. So plus one is head, minus one is tail. And you go through, and so then this gives you a formula in terms of the reflected Brownian motion, ANs being the plus or minus ones, and, and, and uh, JNs being the excursion intervals. So you get a nice formula for, for Brownian motion, and then uh, this, was, this was actually in a, in a paper of uh, Ito and McKean, and, and eventually then appeared in their book as an exercise. Um, I, I, those of you, I mean, this, uh, there's a wonderful uh, uh, presentation by Henry McKean at the Osaka Spa meeting, and he, he really conveyed this idea that, that with Ito, that, that it, all of the all of the analysis about whether he could understand something, I'm paraphrasing quite a bit here, he said it much more eloquently, was really or whether, you know, what was the particle path doing? He wanted to know what the stochastic process was in order to understand analytic results. And, and uh, uh, so, so uh, this, this also is in that spirit of trying to understand um, uh, the, the solutions to these problems in terms of the stochastic process. So, so now with, with, with uh, Ito and McKean, with, with, given the, the existence of skew Brownian motion, that doesn't really solve the problem of what is the particle process uh, that you're going to get in these various examples because you have to tell me what alpha is, for one thing. And probably if you can tell me that, then you know, we can scale it by square root d plus when it's on the that regime and square root d minus, the scaling is going to be relatively straightforward, but you have to find out what alpha is. So what we, I want to just consider here that same problem is just very much like the Ito McKean problem with an interface condition here that's given by lambda and, um, and pose the proper martingale problem. And the mar proper martingale problem, which would correspond to these conditions, is given here. 
And then I want to um, now take advantage of our guest and a very early result of his, I think his PhD thesis, I guess, where uh, Jean-Francois showed the uh, existence of solutions to uh, uh, stochastic differential equation in this form, where this is local time. And you, this is, so you apply uh, Jean-Francois theory with a little Ito Tanaka, and ultimately you get a, uh, a, a, pro a solution to that martingale problem by observing that the process satisfies this stochastic differential equation with this local time term. So all you have to do really then is make this equal to zero. And you, then you make this equal to zero, and then that tells you what alpha is in terms of lambda and the diffusion coefficients. And so the solution is given here, just doing the algebra. Alpha is given by uh, this combination of diffusion coefficient and, um, and uh, interface parameter. If we apply that to the examples, the first two examples, really the only two examples that I have where I know what the interface condition is, in the first one, if we, in the first one, uh, the lambda uh, was uh, uh, d plus over d plus plus d minus. That's because we wanted to have a continuity of flux. So you just put that into this equation up here, and then you find out that the proper alpha, alpha star is given by this ratio. For the continuity of the derivative, lambda was one half, and you substitute that in, and you get this is the proper alpha to use for the representation in that problem. There is a one of the really nice consequences after Ito and McKean of, of uh, the introduction of skew Brownian motion was a paper by uh, John Walsh where he was observing. I mean, at the time, you, the questions, I mean, other than reflecting Brownian motion, were about having uh, continuous semi martingales with discontinuous local times. And, and John Walsh pointed that out as a, as a basic property of, of skew Brownian motion. And um, one, of the questions, one of the questions that we've been trying to deal with ultimately, we would like to be able to talk about these phenomena in higher dimensions. There are many higher dimensional problems. The butterfly problem being an example, for, but there are others, uh, where you'd like to go to, to higher dimensions. And we're trying to find other ways of, of thinking about how you can arrive at this parameter or these, these kinds of proper, these kinds of uh, exp, uh, transition probability, transmission probabilities, alpha or transmission. And, um, and one of the things that we wondered about was, what would happen if we go to example one? In fact, I think the last time I was talking about this stuff after the meeting, I was talking to um, um, someone <laughs> and, and wondering about, sort of out loud about whether one there was some physical reason for maybe you could get continuity of local time as a way to to also characterize this alpha. And it does turn out that that um, in example one, that the modified local time is continuous if and only if alpha is equal to alpha star. So this is a, another characteristic characterization of this particular uh, uh, value of alpha is continuity of what we're calling here modified local time. So what is modified local time? Modified local time means that in defining the local time, typically you, you integrate with respect to quadratic variation of the process. So, you know, for Brownian motion, it doesn't matter because it's dt is dt and is the big measure. But for these processes, it turns out that, that the usual local time that you're considering is where you integrate with respect to quadratic variation. And of course, for skew Brownian motion, it's also the big measure. So, but in the case of, the, of, of, the, of this so-called physical diffusion for this given constants, um, if you integrate with respect to Lebesgue measure, then uh, in place of the quadratic variation, then you do get continuity. And I, I hope I'm making this as clear as I want to make it. The, the, the point is, is that you know, there's a physical process associated with these problems. And that physical process is not skew Brownian motion. It's got, it has skew Brownian motion with this alpha and scaled by those coefficients. So it's a very special structure that way. And, 
And it's the local time of that process. If you define local time by integrating with using Lebesgue measure instead of quadratic variation, that will be continuous. And um, the, the, the reason that that's of interest, as I say to us, is that we're just looking for other ways to probabilistically characterize these choices of parameters. And um, I must say, though, that Brian Wood, who's the, the, the uh, engineering guy, the, the environmental science person in this project, he was really happy when we changed over to that definition of local time for this result because it had physical units that made sense to him that didn't make sense to him ever when we talk about, if you think about the units of, of, of local time, it's not time in the case of when you define integration with respect to quadratic variation. Anyway, so let's come back. I want to now use this to look at this problem that uh, you, you get. Let's suppose that, uh, so I have the coarse, uh, the fine grain glass on this side and the coarse grain on that side. And I can either inject and retrieve it over here or inject it here and retrieve it over here. And the question is, which one would get out quicker? Do people have intuition about that? I won't take a vote, but um, speak up if you do. Okay. So um, the answer is that, according to the experiments, that if you, you inject at minus 1, it will arrive faster at 1 than when it's injected here. So find a course is, is faster than course defined. And I just want to kind of go through a little bit of the exercises to explain that. So the, what one would first do to, to, to well, Here's the theorem. It's, I, I guess uh, I, I can, it's a little bit stronger. There's a constant times that, actually, that is less than. But there's a stochastic ordering of the breakthrough times um, in going from minus y to y versus going from y, where here y is equal to minus 1. Or y is equal to 1, sorry. Yeah, y is equal to 1. And that, so, that, so there's a stochastic ordering of the first passage times in going from left to right versus right to left. And it really is a strict inequality, and there's actually a constant there. But um, to prove that, and I don't want to, I, I don't want to uh, go through, the, I, I just, it's too much here on the screen. But the obvious place to start is with skew Brownian motion, right? You just take skew Brownian motion, and you take alpha bigger than half, and then you see if there's a, uh, an ordering here. And uh, there is an ordering here uh, between the first passage times for just skew Brownian motion. And there's a fact, this is a factor of 1 minus alpha over alpha in, in, in that ordering. So this is less than that. So there, there, there is an actual stochastic ordering. And, um, and uh, the proof is based on looking back at this. There's a natural coupling that you can, you know, you can write those plus or minus coin tossings all in terms of a single sequence of uniform random variables. So you have this, so it gives you a way of comparing the effects of alpha and drawing the curves and, and, and so forth. So, so there's a way of, of, of actually using that representation uh, and um, to, to, to make this calculation. So at least for skew Brownian motion, you show, well, there is that kind of stochastic ordering of the passage times. But you know, for the physical diffusion process, it's, it's a little bit different because there are also, you have to scale that. And the scaling kind of has the opposite effect as alpha. And, and so, you, so I, I, it's shown here in the calculations because they're appearing in reciprocals of these, of these scalings. However, nonetheless, I'm just going to, you have to believe me, because I'm not going to go through, I, I'm not any good at explaining like on these slides like this anyway. But I want to give enough here to show that there, there are competing things going on between the alpha and the, and, and the diffusion coefficients over in the fast and slow regime. So you basically work with four different inequalities, sorry, and, um, and, uh, and you end up showing that, the, that there is a stochastic ordering of the, of the passage times. So that's consistent with the experiments. Um, This is, a, this is actually uh, my, my last uh, slide here. Because um, there's an, an alternative, and I think this is more or less what I talked about last time when, when we were here, an alternative uh, to this 
stochastic ordering, and this is a more uh, uh, of, of the uh, first passage times, is actually to compute the, the resident concentration, I mean, to, to solve the, 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 uh, the PDE. And one can do that by a change of measure, and, and, and it converts the problem into uh, a problem where ultimately what you really want to know are the distributions of a, uh, a skew Brownian motion position, its local time, and an occupation time of the positive axis. You have to know how much time it's spending on the positive axis. And uh, we were able to uh, derive a, a nice simple density, which I'm just showing here, for, for, for the triple density in the case of uh, these, uh, these three processes uh, that basically extends, um, there was, in the case of, of the case of Brownian motion, this uh, triple density was known um, by, uh, who, who was it? Uh, I can't remember now. Um, the, the, a formula had been known in the case of, of where, where this alpha is a half. Um, but uh, in, in that case, you can plot, this is actually just the flux and then rescaled by a, a cross-sectional area and the velocity. So this is really just the flux. And you can, you can, by a plot of that, you also see these curves, which are showing the same kinds of shifts that are showing in the experimental curves. The question of whether or not those are first passage times or these kinds of uh, flux curves, you know, from an experimental point of view is, is a little bit, uh, I think it can go either way because it's, pro it's really neither because of, you know, experimentally when you, when you measure, are you really measuring, for, to measure actual first passage is, is, uh, is a non-trivial object as well as measuring this actual flux. So, um, they're both consistent with experiment. And finally, I'll uh, put a problem up that, uh, that uh, we can add to Yuval's list. Um, in the case of first passage time distributions for skew Brownian motion, uh, recently, uh, Tulanka and Dan uh, Sheldon, both, Dan is a, uh, a postdoc at OSU, and, and Tulanka, they were able to compute the first passage time uh, for skew Brownian motion by analyzing excursions of, of Brownian motion, and that's, a, that's on the archive. But what's, op what's the open problem is that to, to try to find a formula for skew Brownian motion with drift, uh, and you know, unlike the case of Brownian motion where that's an easy problem because you do a Gersonoff and, and so on, in this world of discontinuous coefficients and so forth, you have to contend with uh, local times all over the place. And, and it makes it not so obvious, at least to us. So um, I, think that's, uh, uh, I think that's the end of it. Yes, thank you. Uh, excuse me, one more thing. So I usually try to uh, help out with Bernoulli Society these days. And I have in the back uh, forms. One is for the next Stochastic Processes uh, Conference, which will be in June in uh, Oaxaca, Mexico. And I put uh, form, the flyers back there. And also, uh, especially for graduate students, because membership is free in Bernoulli Society. It's, subsidi it's subsidized by the Bernoulli Society for graduate students. And so there's membership forms, the membership forms for everyone, but in particular, graduate students have an opportunity to have free membership. And there are benefits for that. Okay. Thank you again. <laughs> so, any questions? For